Here we go. Well, a little bit of background wise. Certainly uh, a native of Pakistan. Why did you decide to become a doctor at first and then become a surgeon? My father is a physiotherapist. All of his life he, he had an ambition that, that um, he could never become a doctor himself. So he wanted his eldest son to be a doctor. And so he worked very hard, three shifts in his life, to provide for his son to become a doctor. My father actually wanted me to become a cardiologist when I became a doctor. But um, I had, I had um, um, a liking for surgery because I, 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 I could help a lot more people. And one of the things that I used to do when I was in Pakistan was I saw these people with polio. They were on the streets begging. And I really wanted to help them. And that's what inspired me to become an orthopedic surgeon. I actually would pick these people up from the streets and say, let me take you to the hospital. Let me see if I can do something for you so you can actually not beg. You can become useful citizens of a society. And that's how, what inspired me to become an orthopedic surgeon. What attributes do you think you possess that makes you an expert physician and an excellent surgeon? I, if you look at just my training, I, when I um, just, I'm, I'm board certified in orthopedic surgery. I have a fellowship training in adult spine surgery from the University of Louisville. I have a fellowship training in pediatric orthopedics from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital for one year. I have a fellowship training in pediatric spinal problems, spinal deformities from the Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas, Texas. I have a fellowship training in infantile spinal deformity for six months from the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in London. And I have a fellowship for in six months in, in tumors, in oncology, for six months from University of Florida in Gainesville. If you just look at the mere volume of the training, I am more trained in a dedicated way than probably anybody, not even in this area, but if you look at nationally, I've, I'm one of the few people who has such f formal training, who has received such formal training in almost every aspect of spine, from infantile spine all the way to adult spine. How would you rate yourself as a surgeon? If you played the, the school uh, situation, how would you grade yourself as a surgeon, do you think? Well, let's put it this way. I take on the most complex cases that no one else will take. So if that, that tells you how my, my patients and, I, and I, I rate myself a surgeon, is that I will take on cases that no one else will take. You consider yourself a good surgeon? I would hope so. If that's the case, what is prompting these civil actions and this criminal complaint in your view, in your mind? So if you look at just the historical data, before a plaintiff's attorney came on the news and, and riled up what we feel are very unjust racist remarks, and I'm not going to go in, into those, if you look at the history prior to that, we had very, very, I've been in this, in this city since 1997. And if you look at till February of last year, look at how many lawsuits were there. They were negligible. And then this person comes on TV and literally defames, stirs up a, an entirely unnecessary divisive racial war, calls me every single slur and then starts the whole piling effect. And, and unfortunately tells people here is some gold mine from which they can, that he would like to share. You, we all know the caliber of that person who is doing that and the source from which he is doing that. And I'm not going in, in, the, in, the, in the business of mudslinging, so I'm, not, I'm going to stop right here. And, and so, but I can tell you this, we have never paid a single penny on a claim and don't intend to pay one on a claim ever. We, we, find, we fi find these lawsuit civil actions frivolous, filed by an irresponsible person, even without filing affidavit of merits on these cases. 
and we and we find them this action reprehensible and we will fight them let me address the criminal complaint very specifically which you've seen your attorneys both have seen the criminal complaint in many of the civil lawsuits suggest you performed unnecessary surgeries how do you respond to that first first of all I'll categorically deny that we have ever performed unnecessary surgery number one number two the five cases that the federal complaint has cited are in a very a very complex surgery in a very rare genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and there's a very few people in this country that actually know about this disorder and there are just three centers across this nation that deal with this so my answer to your question it is it is a difference of opinion between people who know about this disorder and the vast majority of people who don't know. So it is a, I understand if someone says that this is unnecessary, I'm happy to sit down in an academic discussion and show them where we derive our data and where we feel necessary. And all you have to do, and hopefully you, I hope you will, is talk to our patients who had the similar surgery that the feds have complained and listen to the patients themselves and they will tell you whether they benefited from the surgery or not. So you're saying basically if I hear you correctly that you believe that the surgeries that were done in any and all cases were appropriate and necessary. Correct. The criminal complaint and many of the civil lawsuits suggest you engaged in Medicare fraud. How do you respond to that? Absolutely not. Absolutely categorically not. We have you know, and this is, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever on our side that we feel that we have engaged in any such behavior. There are rumblings of people who worked at Westchester Hospital saying that there was billing done under your name when somebody else did surgeries. How do you respond to that? Absolutely. Well, we're not going to respond to what other people okay. have said. If, 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 you can, if you can produce those statements and uh, we can look at them. Uh, we'll respond to that, but other people's speculations, no. The doctor is here to address whatever he's done. The criminal complaint. Are you guilty of the charges in this criminal complaint? Yes or no, and if not, why not? Absolutely not. We are not criminal, we are not guilty of any of these complaints, number one. And the reason why is, as I said before, we, these, these are academic discussions about a difference of opinion between experts, not only experts, super experts, and if anybody in the orthopedic or neurosurgical world who knows more about EDS than I or some of the other people who deal with EDS do, then I'm willing to sit across the table from these people and have an intellectual discussion. If that is the basis, if that is considered as the basis of, of, of um, um, unnecessary surgery, then I'm willing to sit down in, in any forum and, and discuss it with anybody who is alleging that. The government claims a scheme to defraud, or the exact words from the complaint, deriving significant profits by convincing patients to undergo medically unnecessary spinal surgery and by billing for those fraudulent surgeries. Exact words from the criminal complaint. Your response to that, sir? Again, we completely deny it, and absolutely deny it. The government alleges in some cases this scheme to defraud resulted in serious bodily injury. How do you respond to that part of the complaint? That is factually as incorrect as it gets. And I can just tell you, and you will have the opportunity after this, to talk to our patients who had the similar surgery that has been done. And you can talk to them. And th there, is, there has not a single, so when we deal with spine surgery, especially in the area that the federal government is alleging, which is the upper cervical spine right below the skull. You know, in that area, the, if something goes wrong, as, as, as they are alleging, the, the results are catastrophic, meaning either, either you are completely paralyzed or you are dead. I can just assure you and tell you, not a single one of our patients has either one of those problems. If I can speak to that moment, yes, sir. You know, and for, for your benefit, as you know, we've reviewed several cases over the last several months because this is not just been happening the last couple of weeks, there have been several.
medical case. And as we review these medical charts and these cases, I can, I can tell you that we see no permanent serious injuries. We see no quadriplegia, paraplegia, death, anything in that category. What we see is, at most, they elect to have the instrumentation taken off. That is what we see. Every now and then they'll go to a subsequent treater and have the instrumentation, whether it be a cassette screw or a rod, taken off. We, I can tell you right now, as we sit here today, we've gone through many, many charts with several experts. We see no catastrophic permanent injuries on any of these, any of these allegations. Okay. Getting back to the questions then. In the civil suits, the claim is made that other doctors have reviewed the radiology and patient records and believe, in their expert opinion, that in many cases the surgery was not needed. Your response? Again, as I said before, this is a difference of opinion between experts. And I'm, I absolutely welcome an academic debate about the difference of opinion. And when it comes to, the, to any of these cases, when they come to, the, to a trial, we absolutely will defend them from experts on our side. And that's, that, is, that is, if someone is alleging that, then by all means, we are willing to, to, to bring our experts and ourselves and defend ourselves. The government complaint, uh, continuing in that vein, alleges that you would persuade patients surgery was the only option when, in fact, patients did not need surgery and the other treatments and other treatments could have been more effective. How do you answer that claim? Let, first of all, I completely de deny it, number one. Let me explain to you why I say so. The vast, vast majority, if anyone who has ever been to my, to my waiting room will realize that I take on the most complex cases that no one else has w w would would touch and i tell you why the vast majority of these patients have already had w a surgery or two by the local s surgeons over here then these people then subsequently are sent to pain management physicians where they receive countless epidural injections and radio frequencies and spinal cord stimulator trials and everything at that point, unfortunately, these people are now habituated to narcotic medication. As a result of it, they end up losing their jobs, destroying their lives, and losing their insurances. And then they end up on assistance, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid. And then those treating physicians at that point, you know, tell them there's nothing more they can do for them. And then these people end up on their primary care doctors, who will then subsequently send it to me with a frantic plea for help. So to say, and even, even in the federal complaint, it says only 20, I have offered surgery to between 20 to 21 to 29 percent of patients. So that means 70 to 80 percent of people I didn't offer an operation. So even in those people, I only offered help to two or three people out of 10. So, and those were the people that I fe felt that could be helped. Now, these people completely understood going in that I couldn't take away every single pain of theirs. I was addressing one specific issue and telling them very clearly, is that good enough for you? And they said, yes, doc, anything is better than that. The, the pain that I'm in. So no one told them that you're gonna be completely normal. No back surgery ever makes you normal. It makes you functional. And that was our goal. So anyone who says, that I persuaded people is completely wrong. Going back to the government complaint, alleging telling a patient medical situation was urgent, the surgery was needed right away, and the patient was at risk of grave injuries without that surgery. Again, the words right from the criminal complaint that you've seen. Okay. Again, completely factually untrue. You know, you know, just to just to give you an idea, I mean, our we we have patients we very 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 rarely has ever signed up people you know that say oh you, you are here in the office today you need an operation tomorrow I mean absolutely not going back to the government complaint alleging many of the people you treated for back and neck pain were left in a worse position due to the unnecessary surgeries again wording directly from the criminal complaint that you've seen again factually untrue and if you just look at our patient patient volumes and, and, and our patients.
the vast, vast majority of our patients are extremely grateful and extremely happy. And the, and the evidence to that is about 65% of our patients, my new patients, come from my other patients. So if you tell me my patients were that, that unhappy, they are sending their family members and their friends to go see the doctor. 65 to over 65 percent of my patients come from my other patients. If you had anything to say to the patients who claim that they're worse off now than they were before the surgeries, how would you respond to them? What would you tell them? First of all, I, I tell them that I have all the sympathy in the world for them. I, st I, I still love them the way I loved them when they were my patients. Okay? I, I'm, I'm deeply saddened that they have been misled by a very unprofessional conduct of, of a plaintiff's attorney. And I have taken care of them all of this time. And, I'm, and I've done my best to help them to the best of my abilities. You've been ordered, as part of the uh, bond, you've been ordered to write a letter to patients that have upcoming appointments, telling them about the criminal complaint. What's been the response to those patients? What's been the impact of all this uh, activity on your business? Our patients who believe in me have stood by me and, and, and they have made it a cause for themselves. As you have heard, several of my patients on TV before who have called themselves as a witch hunt, and, and a lot of my patients, and you will interview some afterwards, who want you to come and have their voices heard, and I am absolutely humbled. And in, uh, I will remain indebted with the gratitude to my patients who literally have still have come every single day, call me every single day to show support, and they made it a cause for themselves to fight on my behalf, on the doctor they believe in. And I want to tell them that their love and their compassion has given me the strength today to endure all of this and still sit in front and stand upright and tall. How do you go about averaging a normal day uh, in this kind of environment right now? You know, Tom, um, <clears throat> it's not about me. I have two um, young kids. The manner um, in which all of this has been conducted is extremely unfair. And my thought through all of this has never been about me. It has gone to three people. My children, my patients, And remember, I run a company. I have over 30 employees. Are their lives and their families. But I want to tell everyone, we will fight. And we will defend our, ourselves against these allegations. You think you're being treated unfairly, being targeted? I think it's very obvious. The volume of lawsuits, has anybody sitting at the table seen this kind of volume and from one particular practitioner? I've never seen it in my career. I've been doing this for 39 years, defending physicians here and all over Ohio. And I've never seen anything even approaching this. But I think that that kind of demonstrates the, the, the process that we're dealing with here, is that the, the sheer volume of these cases Many, as the doctor has indicated initially, without affidavits of merit, for those that don't understand that medical malpractice requires an affidavit of merit from an appropriate expert before you can file these lawsuits. So we have scores of these complaints being filed, frankly, in an effort to just overwhelm, to shock, and to destroy this man into the settlement to give him up. And I mean, I've never seen anything quite like it, but I'll tell you this if you consider the source, you consider the the manner in which this is being litigated, and we don't have 
could go to, everybody knows what's happening here, the racial slurs, the, the negative publicity, the inappropriate behavior, possibly being thrown. Uh, it's just outside the normal, normal profession or that we, the Bruce and I, uh, give our lives and our, our, our whole identity to. It's just not appropriate. And we will be in the courtroom time and time and time again where we belong with these issues and we will prevent them. Certainly there are people who will listen to excerpts from this interview, see it online, read about it online, and are going to be very skeptical about the whole thing. How do you respond to that kind of thing? They're going to say, he says he's innocent. Well, I don't believe him. He says he didn't do this. I don't believe him. How do you uh, take those kind of criticisms? Everyone has the right to form their opinion. All I say is listen to the facts. Let the facts speak for themselves. We have never paid one dime on any malpractice claim, and we don't intend to. Any comments at all about the 150 lawsuits? Anything else you'd like to say about this whole aura of the, the, the piling on, as you called it? As I s said it to you in my, f in my answer ago, look at what happened. I've been in this city from 1997 till February of this year. Look at the lawsuit and look when an irresponsible attorney used very provocative racial language to stir this. And look at the piling effect after this. And, and as I said it before, the vast, a lot of these lawsuits have been filed even without an affidavit of matter. So, the facts have never, not even been seen. No one, so he's filing lawsuits without even having, the, having them reviewed. You've been at a number of hospitals in the area, either have left them or privileges revoked. These, those are my words from what I understand. Why has this happened? Why has this occurred? Well, let me, let me stop yeah, here. Okay, okay. No, it's okay. I want to address this for you. Number one, his privileges have never been revoked. Never have. Dr. Grani has been to several hospitals over the years. The, the and all any time a physician has privileges or, or leaves, those are confidential issues that we really aren't allowed to talk about. However, let me just say this: that if there's revocation of privileges, that's always reported in what's called the National Reporting Data Guide. Okay, so so if if any of Dr. Grani's privileges have ever been revoked by any hospital ever, you would see that in the National Reporting Data Guide. Well, there is none. That's not reported. So that clears that up. Dr. Durrani has, when he was at Children's Hospital, he left and went to private practice. He was at Good Samaritan Hospital, Price Hospital. He then moved out to Westchester. He, he had no reason to come back down here. All his patients were out there at UC Westchester for several years. And that's why he, he moved on. That's all it amounts to. This idea that he's been kicked off staffs and things is just inappropriate. Bruce, anything you'd like to add? Uh, I'm pretty. Well, I would say this. Uh, I have seen the piling on um, uh, in one other case where I represented a doctor previously, and I've seen this happen before. Uh, the the uh, allegations against a doctor, especially a, a foreign-born doctor who's come here to this country to, uh, to become a citizen, uh, very unfair, and uh, it riles people up, uh, and, and people uh, come in because they believe, they honestly believe, that uh, they're going to get uh, a lot of money uh, from, from uh, lawsuits. And as a result, it becomes this piling on effect. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing here. With respect to the criminal charges, uh, we've reviewed those, those files. Um, the, those, uh, those files show that the patients had significant prior treatment by other physicians uh, before they finally got to Dr. Durrani for surgery. And uh, we believe that we can defend those cases. Do you expect an indictment in this case? That's not for me to answer. Okay. 